It's the middle of the night. Your room is dark except for the LED numbers on your alarm clock. They spell out 3.30 a.m. You've just woken up with a great story idea. You need to scratch it down on the pad next to you so it doesn't disappear. It doesn't. You get excited about it. You start doing some research. Maybe you talk to a few people, ask some questions. The story starts to take shape. You invite a guest to record an interview It's starting to have form and meaning and music. You're up late too many times trying to make it great or maybe just finish it and put it out there in the world. Why? I think for all of us, it's because we want to make an impact. We want listeners to resonate with our work. We want to know it matters. Along comes Julia Barton. You might not know her name, but you definitely know her work. She's the vice president and executive editor of Pushkin Industries, Malcolm Gladwell's company. She shapes revisionist history and so many more of Pushkin's podcasts and audiobooks. She's a force. Which is why you need to listen to Pushkin's new anthology, The Best Audio Storytelling 2022. It's a first annual collection of the finest work Julia and her colleagues at Pushkin and beyond identified as powerful and innovative. David Sedaris wrote the foreword. Coming up, Julia and I pull back the curtain on the creative choices of three of the top audio makers in this collection. Tune in. Next time you wake up with a brilliant idea in the wee hours, you'll be glad you did. This is Sound Judgment, where we investigate just what it takes to become a beloved podcast host by pulling apart one episode at a time together. I'm Elaine Appleton-Grant. Storytellers, this season is ending soon. To celebrate, we're sharing your voices on a future episode. Record a voice memo telling us your favorite Sound Judgment episode and why. Include your name and the name of your podcast. We may air your messages early as our season finale on June 29th. Email it today to allies at podcastallies.com. That's allies at podcastallies.com. And see our show notes for a contest entry form to win merch from one of the podcasts we featured this season. Good luck and thank you. Welcome, Julia Barton, to Sound Judgment. I am so delighted to have you here. Thank you. I'm thrilled to be here. I want to start by asking you to read something you wrote for a column you named Audio Danger more than a decade ago. Writers and video producers live in dread of the wandering eye. Audio producers live for it. That's what makes us, in our secret hearts, troublemakers. We want you to lose sight of everything in front of your face, to stare through that dish in your hand, ignore your children, drop into a glazed-over trance of our making. Maybe don't drive off the road, but please do miss a few exits or get stuck in your car. Good audio should be dangerous that way. That piece was reprinted in a new Audio Danger column, a column Julia revived recently for Storyboard, a publication of the Neiman Foundation. Neiman is an incredible organization that administers the oldest fellowship for journalists in the world. Julia recently won that fellowship. She'll be part of the 2024 class. I love that passage. So, well, thank you. So with, because I think about it the exact same way, but I have never summed it up so eloquently and and with so much fun, you know. I, I mean, in public radio, one of the first things that we all learn is all listeners have something else to do. They're washing the dishes. That's like the typical yep. one. Or you're driving. Um, I love ignore your children. That's hysterical. <laughs> also impossible. But, <laughs> impossible. You know, yeah. Throw it in there. Exactly. Yeah. So with the audio danger passage in mind, as we're about to talk about, you just curated what you folks claim is the first audio anthology of best audio stories of its kind. How do you define what the best is? Well, I mean, it's a it's a word that's a conceit. It It's a nice, tight word that fits on a cover. You know, I mean, but uh, it's also things that, you know, when we put out the nomination process first to the staff at Pushkin, and then we sort of reached out to people 
whose opinions we value just to get a wider diversity of of nominations, we were thinking about stuff that we as practitioners can learn from, that it would inspire us, that would create our own professional admiration, and also challenge us to do better in our own work by hearing people successfully take risks with the form. And you use in particular the words innovative and powerful in the description of the anthology. With so much audio being produced every single day, how much did you wrestle with what actually is innovative? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a big challenge, right? So some of the stuff in there is weird. So to me, that's hard to pull off. Again, it's things that took risks. And then there was also sort of an informal test, which was, did it stay with me days later? Was I still thinking about it or ruminating on some moment or puzzling over some question? Did I want to hear more if it was part of a series? Did I want to hear the next episode? Did I want to go into the back catalog and like see what else this person has made because they're so original? So there were all those kinds of questions and as well as technique, you know, like could I learn from this storyteller or this production team or their choices? Would it make me better at my job? Mm -hmm. And then the other word was powerful, which I was particularly curious about. How do you determine whether something's powerful? Again, I mean, all of those criteria, but also did it just do something that I don't understand? Like, I don't know how they pulled that off. Uh -huh. Do you know? Like, uh -huh. I don't know why I'm crying right now, Like, but I am crying about this person that I previously, until, you know, I started listening 20 minutes ago, I didn't knew nothing about. And I know from making audio that those are choices that the producers make. It doesn't come out of the microphone or into the microphone in that particular fashion, usually. Um, there's something about the elements of writing, of voice, of adjacency in the way you assemble the tape that creates that emotional impact or even that intellectual impact. Or it's making me laugh and I'm still laughing about it like three days later when I remember it. All of those things are challenging to pull off. Right. And and let me let me try to understand what you're doing. I mean, that's that's what sound judgment is all about is mm -hmm. let's pull it apart so that we can understand what you did in such and such a spot or throughout the structure or your choice of a particular topic or a person in the first place. All the different choices that we make as producers and hosts, delivery, um, mm -hmm. to keep people compelled listening all the way through and coming back. There's so much attention paid in in all the writing and talking about the podcast industry to the industry and to the business behind it. Yeah. And so little attention paid to the craft. I'm right there with you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's like shining a light on this, this craft that is literally invisible. So people need to shine a light on it yeah. because otherwise if we don't do it ourselves, no one's going to do it. Well, and you called out one of the biggest problems, I think, in the industry right now in your first Audio Danger column of this year mm -hmm. when you said, you know, sort of the democratization of the technology that's allowed the podcast industry to boom has also sort of doubled down on this idea that it's just talking. Yeah. Right? Talk about that, and then we'll launch into, you know, pulling apart some of some of the audio. Right. So there's a I mean, there's a great benefit to having a forum that's accessible. You know, you can upload a voice memo and call it a podcast. And there's value in that. I, I definitely think that is true. But the issue is, can people make a living at it? Is there a way to be have a profession? And that's the challenge, right? And I think especially because audio is not visible it sort of bypasses the part of our mind that categorizes things. I think it's easier to categorize things when you see them than to hold all the audio categories in your head, yeah, yeah. so to speak. And so when things are not categorized, they blur together as one thing. So the show that I make with Michael Lewis, you know, where we spend a good part of a year creating seven episodes, comes across as the same 
as the voice memo podcast. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could hear them side by side and know they were not the same thing, but you might not know exactly why they're not. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of that. There's this funny spoof of podcasting on Portlandia Uh where they're they're narrating the podcast in the police station and then sticking the microphone in front of people to talk about the crime. And then there's like a little ukulele (laughs) mandolin player (laughs) behind them scoring instantly. And I mean, it was making fun of podcasting, but it was also like that's what people maybe think how it's made. You know, it's just like (laughs) it takes 20 minutes to make a 20 minute show, you know, and that's just. So not true. <laughs> right? It's not true at all. It's not true <laughs> it's at not all. True. Yeah. I'm Darren Blum. And I'm Dana Blue. And this is Forgotten America, Rural Footprints. Pretty good little tune right there. It's only been three hours since the body was discovered, but already this case is being badly bungled. It's important to remember that many of these cops are poor, uneducated, and bad at their jobs. There's an old saying in this part of the country, and it goes like this. I can't read. Sheriff Hicks was visibly upset. You would Yeah, and there's an illusion of ease that I think, you know, we have to openly talk about our craft and about the challenges and also show appreciation when someone pulls something off. You know, so there are different ways of doing that. There are awards, there are shows like yours, and Best Audio Storytelling is just one iteration of that project that I think... Anyone who's in the profession wants to stop having these arguments about how hard can it be. (laughs) Because it doesn't serve anybody. It doesn't serve even the people who think it should be easy because then then they end up getting frustrated when it's not easy. Mm -hmm. And when the thing that they thought they could get for $9 is not Invisibilia. (laughs) 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 So it's in everyone's interest to try to bring more attention to the craft and the difficulty and the sort of celebrating the risks. Because when people take risks, there are probably a lot of other versions of that that got tossed because the only way you know it's working is to keep trying it and then listening to it again and again and then having other people listen to it and then tweaking it and then listening to it again. It's time, it's time intensive. Let's dive into a couple of your choices. One is I Can Do Anything, which is written and hosted by the author Jason Reynolds. It's part of a four-part Radiotopia podcast called My Mother Made Me. And it's very much about his relationship with his mother, Isabel. This is an essay, but it's a richly produced one, and it does include some conversation with Isabel. Why did you choose it for the anthology? Well, I wanted to start the anthology with something highly written And then kind of like cross over through different types of storytelling to something that was highly non-narrated. And then when I listened to this first episode, I was like, that's so great. His writing, you know, because that's a real high wire act when it's just you and your voice. There is tape in there, but it's really stands or falls on whether you want to listen more to this writing basically. And he's such a master of just wordplay. I mean, the whole title, I Can Do Anything, and also the the series title, My Mother Made Me, he's playing with just the nuances of those verbs. Mm -hmm. There's such a delight in that and his confidence in that. But then he also, the first episode of My Mother Made Me is like a mini overview of the state of podcasting. Yes, it is. There's a lot of montage and play with tape and so it serves as an introduction a second or third introduction to the collection right podcasts on sex and love on crime true and otherwise and of course there's no way to overlook the i don't know at least two million interview shows so what would i have to add to this overloaded treasure trove? Well, turns out, not much. I'm only doing this because my mother made me. He's really playing with how to engage listeners. And something that, you know, was a real revelation for me when I went from editing for public radio to editing authors like Malcolm Gladwell and Michael Lewis and Jill Lepore, Michael Spector... 
these people are masters of prose. And sometimes, you you know, we have all these folkloric <laughs> rules in broadcasting, like, oh, if your copy is more than an inch long or it's like, then it's bad broadcast style. Right. And like these people don't subscribe to any of that. They're like, I have to write the words and keep people entertained with just my words. And sometimes the job of the editor is to just get out of the way. And we couldn't do that in broadcasting, really. I mean, we did have these little audio essays, you know, on public radio occasionally, but that form kind of died out in the 80s and 90s, Mm -hmm. um, the weird audio essay. And then I started to miss it. But now it's like back with a vengeance, which is great. And it's a way for authors also to stretch their skills and reach people in different ways and to play with words in new ways. And there's a joy to that that's new. What made me want to move from print to radio many years ago was its immersive quality, the theater of the mind, that as listeners We can be stuck in traffic one minute and an entirely different world rooting for a character we just met in the next. It takes all kinds of skills to create these worlds in listeners' heads, from writing to sound design to story structure to delivery to the ability to paint scenes so well that as a listener, you can smell the coffee. In this case, the instant coffee. Let's take a listen to such a passage from Jason Reynolds' I Can Do Anything episode from My Mother Made Me. I loved this passage. It shows off the specificity of his writing, his use of place as a way to tell us who his mother is and how he feels about her, and also his particular understanding of the role of the host. I often find that when we talk about audio storytelling, we ignore actual performance on the mic, which is crazy because this is audio and what goes into our ears matters. Notice how confident Jason sounds. He's bringing the listener along on his journey, and he seems to simply know that we'll go with him. Now that you're all warmed up, let's talk about my mom. Most Sundays, I pull up to my mother's house with a coffee in the New York Times. I stop in the middle of the driveway to grab the Washington Post she has delivered every week. Then I ring the doorbell. I got a key, but I never use it, mainly because I love the look of excitement on her face when she opens the door, even though she's always expecting me. Other than holiday decor, and on this Sunday, my mother had broken out the browns, oranges, and yellows for the upcoming Thanksgiving dinner, this house ain't changed in years. From the green carpet to the tchotchkes and old knickknacks that pepper the coffee table, to the gallery wall of random art, including a framed Washington Post profile on me from years ago, as moms do, to the strange assortment of clocks scattered around the living room, dining room, and kitchen, all of which are set to different times. Some 10 minutes fast, others six minutes slow. The radio is always on in the kitchen unless the television is on. And on Sundays, it's the TV, which is strange because my mother don't never sit in the kitchen on Sunday. She sits in the office where there's also a TV. He's very confident with his sentences. And I noticed that as an editor because, like, you know, I would be like that introductory clause about the yellows and the golds is going on way too long. You're going to run out of breath before you get to the verb. But he does it in such a great way the way he reads it, that the the verb is this place ain't changed in years, and it comes at the end of a really long introductory clause. It's hard to pull off an audio, but if you do it, it just lands it. He's clearly confident in his prose and his ability to read his own prose. Mm-hmm. His delivery is magnificent. And then there's sort of a mystery of like, why is his, where's his mom? Like, when's she coming in? And I remember the first time I listened, I was impatient. And then I'm like, oh, he knows what he's doing. Do you know what I mean? So the house is her. He's building her character by describing the house. And you feel like you're in good hands. Yeah. And it's he's bringing his own coffee and then she's drinking like instant coffee. And <laughs> it feels like visiting my grandmother's house, you know, like there's sort of the specificity of it that's beautiful. And also, you know, he keeps her off stage as long as possible. Mm-hmm. It's all interesting moves. You know, say you're a producer and you're working with a host who's a writer. Let them do their thing 
and see what happens. You might be surprised. So I could talk about this particular essay all day, but we do not have time. So storytellers, I want to urge you to listen to the anthology. That link is in our show notes, of course, but also to all of My Mother Made Me. Another piece that you chose, Julia, is Armand's Garden, which is an episode of the Peabody Award-winning podcast Rumble Strip, created and hosted by Erica Heilman. Uh, Julia, sum up this piece for listeners who haven't heard it. I mean, Rumble Strip has a simple mission. Erica is talking with her neighbors and like, random people in Vermont and just really diving deep into their lives, you know, whether their lives are quote unquote ordinary or tragic or funny. It's just something, it's, you know, one one sort of like turning point in a life. It's kind of a documentary show, but it's a poetic documentary show. And that's a style of storytelling that is hard to pull off, but it's kind of in the DNA of public radio in particular and community radio. This voice-driven witnessing of people's stories. And Erica has an amazing way of getting people to tell her their deepest, intense inner life moments. That's incredible. It is incredible. And let me play a clip for you that is very interesting. It's very early on in this piece, Armand's Garden. When I went to visit him, we sat in the tea house and drank coffee. We talked about gardening and what God has to do with gardening, which it turns out is everything. It's funny, one of my strongest memories from childhood is finding my mother digging in her garden and talking to her plants, which I didn't understand at the time, but now I do. I'm not a very good gardener. I don't understand design, but I love my plants, and I love to think about the dirt under my plants. At the end of a long winter, I start dreaming about my plants, and sometimes I just look at a single plant or a tree for a really long time, and I get something, or I hear something. I don't know what it is, but I think Armand does. Here's Armand Patuan. Erica says that sometimes she stares at her plants and she hears something. And then she says, I don't know what it is, but I think Armand does. What do you think admitting on air that she doesn't know something, but her subject does, do for the podcast overall? And what lessons does that present for creators more broadly? Yeah, it creates intrigue. It creates curiosity. And he does, he does have an answer to that question by the end. So she kind of sets up the thing that's going to be, have a satisfying conclusion. But I think something that it's hard for all of us to remember, I mean, it doesn't matter how experienced you are, but you got to leave a hole for the listener to do some work, you know, to fill in, to want to know things. And then it's the credits, but I'm like intrigued. I'm like, I, my brain can't figure all this out, so I better listen to the next episode. Even though it's not related directly, it's like a, a thing to puzzle over. It's like a, a gesture of, like, you hand it back to the listener and, like, I know you're out there doing whatever you're doing. You figure it out. It's hard to do it when you're producing. You're just like, oh, I got to cut, cut that line. It doesn't make any sense. Or, like... I got to answer that question sooner. It's not answered. It's too, taking too long. Mm -hmm. And I think we can overly sort of like fuss and clean up our audio and our stories in a way that this form, like we don't even know what's going on once we put it out in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the more we try to button it up to our satisfaction, the less that gives listeners something to do with the sort of mystery and curiosity and intrigue that we want them to feel. So right. Erica's just, she's just like, there's a big mystery here. I don't understand it. I feel it, but I don't understand it. Okay, let's go to this guy. And then you're set up for the oddness that is Armand. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah. Right, right. Creating momentum for the listener is one of the hardest things to do. Most conversations aren't just naturally suspenseful. We need to add a mystery. I wanted to know how Juliet does that. So I asked her for an example. 
She told me about a revisionist history episode called Burden of Proof. The link's in our show notes. It takes Malcolm Gladwell 11 whole minutes to tell listeners what that episode is actually about. In that time, Malcolm wanted to play clips of a speech he'd given about how much denial people were in a century ago that coal mining caused black lung disease and that miners needed protection. That seems obvious now. And the audience was, as Julia told me, sitting there all smug, thinking, wow, how stupid and cruel people were 100 years ago. And he's like, yeah, but we're doing it right now. In fact, all of you in this room right now are in the exact same position that society was about coal mining. What am I talking about? I'm talking about football. And so he wanted to recreate the sort of mic drop moment of that in the episode. But how? 11 minutes of not talking about football, withholding that information, is a long time. The danger of losing listeners was great. You needed to follow the line of reasoning that he was doing to create the impact of the reveal. Basically, what I was trying to think about was like, what can keep people intrigued and interested until they get to the reveal of the speech? In 11 minutes in. Yeah. Yeah. So Julia came up with a novel idea. They'd let listeners in on what it felt like to be Malcolm Gladwell giving that speech. So what does it feel like to be up there giving a speech that in and of itself is challenging and like knowing whether the audience is following you? So I was like, provide some commentary on your own speech. And then we will feel that that's weird. Like, oh, this is what it's like to give a speech. This is what it's like to feel the room drifting away. That's what the solution that we came up with was that feeling of giving the listener a glimpse into what it's like to give a speech. And you can kind of enter into a dream state of that speech, the interior, you know, the the words coming out of his mouth versus his feelings on the inside. Right. And And so for me, that was a a lot of intrigue. 20 minutes in, I began to panic a little because I'm going on and on about Hoffman, about coal mining, about how big a deal coal was at the turn of the century, about how much dust the process of coal mining created, about how coal miners would have coughing fits and spit up this black, inky substance. And they would cough more and more of it the more they mined and the the more time they spent in the coal mines. That was absolutely beyond question. The audience is incredibly quiet, and I couldn't figure out if that was because they found the subject as fascinating as I did, or if they were thinking, what on earth? The thing that no but one our challenge as producers, you know, the sound the designer, the composer Luis Guerra, the producer Mia Lobel, you know, we were all thinking about, like, how can we build this sequence in the first third of the piece to be interesting enough so that the withholding of information is powerful rather than just mm-hmm. annoying and boring? What Julia did with that revisionist history episode wasn't just about the power of withholding information in order to create suspense and momentum. It's also about the power of pulling back the curtain to show what's going on behind the scenes. In this case, in Malcolm's mind. There's another episode in the anthology that also pulls back the curtain, the episode The Tunnel from the podcast Will Be Wild, which Julia describes as a first draft of history about the January 6th riot. Three months after the January 6th riot, in a drab room with a long white table, two FBI agents begin their interrogation of the man who allegedly tased Officer Mike Fanone. His name is Danny Rodriguez. What I wanted to do is kind of just explain what's happening, Mm -hmm. kind of help us understand, you know, what happened from, from your perspective, okay? Normally, these conversations are private. But in this case, the tape was made public by a judge after Rodriguez's lawyer released the transcript. We reached out to his lawyer. We didn't receive a response. Just a note, this interview tape is nearly four hours long. We're using just parts of it, and we're playing some of it out of order. Because part of the story of January 6th and the lead-up to it and the aftermath is about fake news and media manipulation, we want you to know we've kept the meaning of what people said intact. If you want to check out the original tape and transcript, you can find that in our show notes. 
So this interrogation since one of the main goals of Will Be Wild is to explore the dangers of disinformation, it does seem like it's powerful to fold that goal explicitly into describing the production process and to acknowledge that on air, which is a very unusual thing to do. What is the lesson here for creators looking to weave clear themes throughout their podcasts? Um, I have an editor. <laughs> I think that's the number one thing is because I'm sure it took them a lot of attempts to get that right, that language right, the placement right, the sort of tone right. You know, she's very matter of fact. She's not condescending about it. I admired it for its concision. And I know as an editor, that's hard to do mm-hmm. right. And mm-hmm. so I assume that took a while. If they got it right the first time, good for them. But to have that instinct to take risks and to also be clear is is an editorial process. Do you encourage more of that, sort of pulling back the curtain? I mean, you're talking about that even in the example that you just mentioned about Malcolm Gladwell pulling back the curtain during his speech to say, this is how I felt at this point. Yeah. I think that audio is a really powerful medium for that because... It can get a little self-indulgent, but honestly, people are curious. And because we're only voices to them, to the listener, like anything that allows us in and to feel that we're not just being talked at, but in conversation with somebody who doesn't quite know, you know, is thinking out loud or is curious about their own choices. It makes us feel like more like participants in the story, Mm -hmm. I think. If it's handled well. But you really need to calibrate that with outside people. Like you give it a try and they're like, eh, I feel condescended to. And then you try it again and they're like, I don't know what you're doing there. You know, like I'm confused. And so you need those notes beforehand just to keep trying. And it's so it's challenging, right? Like it's a risk and risks take time. But I think they're better than just doing formulaically the same thing over and over again because it's safe. Talk to me briefly about what's on the horizon for Pushkin and especially the sort of transitional landscape between podcasts and audiobooks, which is a boundary that Pushkin in particular is exploring. Yeah, I mean, we're we're doing a lot of experiments with audiobooks. So thinking about, you know, how how can we take something like an audiobook, which is just straight read and play with it? So there's just a lot of different ways to make audiobooks. I mean, I wasn't a big audiobook listener before Pushkin, you know, started making audiobooks. It's like a new frontier for me as a producer, mm-hmm. right? And then there's a whole crowd of people who only listen to audiobooks. And so something like Best Of, if they run across it, you know, because they're fans of David Sedaris or something like that, it might expose them to work that they might not otherwise even know how to find. Mm. So thinking mm-hmm. about the ways that we can bring these forms together because they're all audio forms. Mm -hmm. They have different (laughs) economies, you know, which is a challenge Mm -hmm. and different publicity mechanisms. But in the craft itself, you know, there's great potential for crossover. So it's really exciting. You know, it's also a production challenge for people who got their start editing, you know, 90 second stand-ups or three minute features to now be working on a nine hour audio book. It's like, it's like a different planet. And that's fun too. It's part of the fun of being in the business at this time is there's this huge landscape of on-demand media that we didn't have access to Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 10 years ago, really. And we can really see the evolution of it, especially Mm -hmm. in that particular crossroads between. But we people talk about podcasts and video and going, well, is a video, you know, what's what Mm -hmm. here? But we don't talk about that transition or that uh, blurring of the line, really, between audiobooks and podcasts very often. And that's a really interesting, very edgy place to be and and exciting, as you said. Um, I'm going to give you a couple of lightning round questions. And then if we have time, if you have another minute, I'll ask you Mm -hmm. uh, one or two more questions. Uh, So lightning round, Julia, Mm -hmm. who would be your dream guest for sound judgment and why? I would bring in someone who's like a show director at one of the big ship shows, um, either at the BBC or at NPR. Which show? ATC, Morning Edition. But the person who has to make so many decisions on the fly 
I interviewed a couple of them um, back in 2013 for 99% Invisible for this episode I did called The Broadcast Clock. And I could have done the whole episode just about them because the stress that they voluntarily put themselves under day after day, they're making all these decisions on the fly about what to do because, you know, there are tape segments, but there's a, it's a live thing. And to me, that mindset is fascinating. It's the air traffic control mindset, and it shapes the sound of everything we hear. That high level of constraint is useful to learn about because then you think about how precious every second is, right, in that world. You can't go over by a second. You just don't have that freedom. And you also don't want to go under by too many seconds because then you have a flaccid <laughs> show with problems to fill. Or Marketplace, that's another crazy one. All of those shows are intensely difficult to build. And I just really admire that craft. And I think those people don't get enough attention. So have one of them on if you can get them. <laughs> I'm going to say so. I'm going to say Julia Barton tells me that I have to have you on. And so they yeah. will. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, great. I love that idea. <laughs> Julia, you have reported or edited for like virtually every well-known network there is. And you're also a journalism trainer and you have taught in places like Russia, Ukraine, Moldova, Estonia. From your vantage point now as executive editor at Pushkin, what role do you see spoken word audio creators playing in this sort of increasingly challenging world that we're in? Yeah, that's a big question. I think, especially in terms of international reporting, there's something really great about audio because it strips away all the visual cues. I do think there's something very powerful about getting to know, you know, Armand's story or hearing Danny Rodriguez and picking up on the cues without seeing those people and, and you know, sort of like filling in information that maybe doesn't belong in your assessment of them and, and getting straight to the story that they're trying to tell. Um, and I think that's very powerful in terms of just allowing our imaginations to reach into communities and, you know, just sort of like human experience in a way that visual media, you know, it's just harder to do it because we just bring our own assessments to people when we see their faces. So that's one powerful, sort of vague sounding answer to that. But I do think it's really important. Great. Will there be a 2023 best of? There's definitely talk at Pushkin of trying to do it again because it was really fun, you know, and it was a great chance for us to reach out to our colleagues in the business and give them some love and also push the audiobook form in a new direction, which is something that people are really behind here. Well, Julia, thank you so much for taking the time to be with me today. It's been so oh, interesting. Thank you for a lovely conversation. At the end of every episode, I give you a few of the many takeaways from these conversations. Here are today's. One, the best audio stories have a clear sound vision. In other words, they really take advantage of the medium. A clear sound vision isn't just sound design, although that's critical. It's also the tone of voice, the pacing, the dynamics of the voices. It all adds up to how you want the listener to feel. Notice how different the sound visions are of the three stories we talked about. Two, Suspense and curiosity helps create the momentum for the listener. They propel us forward. When there isn't any in the subject inherently, experiment with ways to create it. Jason Reynolds keeps his mother off stage for as long as possible. Malcolm Gladwell and Julia integrated a long speech with his interior thoughts and feelings while giving that speech, which makes you wonder, along with him, whether the audience hates it or loves it. Will they hang in? Three, consider pulling back the curtain on your process or someone's feelings, like we just talked about. Don't be indulgent, but know as well that listeners are often curious. And when it's completely relevant to the topic, like it is with Will Be Wild, being transparent about your process helps ensure credibility. Four, finally, experiment. Test your work with others. Is it innovative, powerful, entertaining? Take notes. 
revise. That's all for today. Thanks for being with me. When we talked about getting a sound designer involved in your team up front, I mentioned a few other sound judgment episodes. If you're interested in sound design, you'll love Gilbert King and Kelsey Decker's episode on Bone Valley and Sally Herships on The Heist. The links are in our show notes. Want to help other audio creators and writers find our show? Please give us a shout out on social media. And if you do, tag me on LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram. Sound Judgment is produced by me, Elaine Appleton Grant. Audrey Nelson helped produce this episode. Sound design by Andrew Corella. Our gorgeous cover art is by Sarah Edgel. Podcast management by Tina Basir. Coming next week, the makers of Famous and Gravy, the podcast that asks, would you want this dead celebrity's life? So much fun. And that will be the last episode in this season before we take some time off for the summer and get ready for season three, launching at the end of August. See you soon.